Um, today's date is April the 10th, 2022. We have a simulation today with uh, Israeli-Palestinian simulation with Mona Ali Halil. Um, we having a Hebrew interpreter and a English interpreter. So if you want to um, listen to this in English, in uh, I'm sorry, Hebrew and Arabic interpreter. And if you want to listen to this in Hebrew, please go to the Hebrew, to the international icon, the same with Arabic and switch to Arabic. So uh, Tahsin, can you make the announcement in Arabic and then you I don't can know make the announcement the in Hebrew? I don't know what the technical issue is at my end or theirs. Judith, can you make it? Thank you. So today is April 10, 2022. We have a Israeli-Palestinian simulation with Mona Ali Khalil. Uh, for some reason, I hear. Uh, yeah, Tashin, you have to be in your Arabic channel. Um, we are proposing a common government for the people of Israel and Palestine uh, that would include the area of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, 14 million people. We believe that a common government based on secular democratic principle could make peace for the people of Israel and Palestine. It would have its own, it would be separate from the Israeli and the Palestinian government, but it will work together with them, but independent of them. Uh, my name is Joseph Avasar. My email is josephavasar at gmail.com. We have a website, it's ipconfederation.org. The website is, has, uh, is in three languages, Arabic, English, and Hebrew. If you go to the website, you can see the constitution. The constitution explains the essence of this government, how it would be created, that it would be a government for the people of Israel, Palestine, uh, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, 14 million people, one person, one vote, with equality for everyone, a government with three branches, the, um, the parliament, which is the legislative branch, that's the, uh, that's the branch that makes the laws, a executive branch, that's the branch that execute the laws, that would be the president and the vice president, and a judicial branch that would be judges for Israelis and Palestinian people together with Israeli and Palestinian judges together uh, to, uh, to adjudicate the legislation that was passed by the parliament. The website explains how this government will be created and what would be the relationship between the common government and the government of Israel and the government of Palestine. It's a very interesting reading. I hope you do. And you can also go to the frequent, frequently asked questions. It explains in essence how this government will work. But the main idea is that it's an equal government for the people of Israel and Palestine for them together. Um, Today we have our speaker is Mona Ali Khalil. Mona Ali Khalil is a public international lawyer of Palestinian origin with 25 years of United Nations experience. 
She worked on special assignments relating to the conflicts in Iraq, Libya, and Syria. Ms. Khalil worked on issues relating to international peace and security, including peacekeeping, protection of civilians, counterterrorism, and disarmament. She also worked with the International Atomic Energy, the IAEA, to combat nuclear terrorism. Ms. Halil is an affiliate of the Harvard Law School Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. She received her Jewish doctorate and master's in foreign service from Georgetown University and a master in Middle East studies from Harvard University. I should add that um, Mona uh, and I had she basically suggested that. That was a brilliant suggestion in my, in my opinion. She su suggested that we go over the simulation ahead of time. And she went over all the legislation. We spent um, over an hour, I believe, on Zoom. And I think that because of her suggestion, which I'm gonna adapt from now on, the simulation is going to uh, go faster and it's going to be a, uh, more uh, to the point and more uh, streamlined. So thank you, Mona. Great suggestion. Um, we invite people with all points of views. It doesn't really matter to us what point of view. We invite everyone to stress test the formula of, that we are suggesting for peace. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, law professor John Quigley. He's on April 24, 2022. The next speaker on May 8 is Lawrence Wilkerson. He was the, sec uh, the late Secretary of State Colin Powell, um, Chief of Staff, both as a general and as Secretary of State. Then we will have uh, uh, parents and family members who became victims as a result of this uh, conflict. That's on May 22nd, 2022. It's called the Parents Family Circle Family Forum. We will have on June 5th, a Victor Feldman. He is the founder of Betzelen, and he's a lawyer, he's a civil rights attorney in Israel. Then we will have Professor Muhammad Dajani Daoudi. He was a Palestinian peace activist on June 19, 2022. The simulation timeline is, we anticipate that the whole event will be 120 minutes. That's usually how, it, how much it takes. We will have several segments starting with the uh, Constitution, and then we'll go through legislation. And like I said, uh, Mona is already familiar with this, so it would be, uh, I think it will be faster, and we'd be able to deal with more legislation than we usually do. And then we'll have a conversation with our speaker and uh, audience question and answer, and then our closing remarks. Um, Tahsin, can you make the announcement in Arabic just for the people who showed up late? And Judith, could you make it in Hebrew, please? Thank you. The rest of you, um, if you want to hear it in English, just stay on the English channel. We have a short video that explains what the IPC is about. It's two and a half minutes. I'd like to play it.
The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has endured for generations. And instead of time healing the wounds, it's only caused the anger to fester and the violence to grow. But what if there was a way to alleviate the tension? Something that may not outright solve every problem, but at least create a forum that encourages a peaceful compromise. Welcome to the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, a common third government between the Israeli and Palestinian citizens, specifically designed to foster peace, tolerance, and economic prosperity between the two nations. Here's how it works. First off, both Israel and Palestine will keep their respective governments. Israelis Knesset and the Palestinian National Authority will remain unchanged. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, IPC, will be a third entity acting as a unifying agent between the two. The IPC will comprise 300 parliament members elected from 300 districts in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Above them will preside a president and vice president, one Israeli and one Palestinian. In order for the IPC to pass a law, it will require a 55% majority from its Israeli representatives, as well as a 55% majority from its Palestinian representatives, thereby preventing either side from monopolizing the legislature. Of course, the IPC won't undermine the political power of either the Israeli or the Palestinian government. At any time, Israel or Palestine may veto a law passed by the IPC. If neither side vetoes, the law is passed and the two nations are another step closer to resolution. Please help us make this a reality. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. We might speak different languages, but we all mean the same thing. So the objective of the simulation is to demonstrate how the IPC, the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, a common government for the people of Israel and Palestine could make peace. Not only do we believe that it would make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians, but also, and I wish someone would ask me about that, it could make peace between the, in the entire neighborhood, between Israel and the Palestinians and, and Lebanon, Syria, Iran, Iraq, etc. We are not, however, having a historical review of the conflict. We're not here to discuss who is at fault and who is to blame. We are not anti-Israel and we are not anti-Palestine. We are pro-peace. Um, our speaker, Mona Ali Khalid, she's not a representative of the IPC. She was invited to speak, to give her opinion about the IPC concept. Is it a good concept? Is it a bad concept? Why is it good? Why is it bad? Why, and et cetera. She's in, but she's not the speaker. She's not a representative of the IPC. We are pro-peace. We follow our own narrative. Basically in this simulation, we pretend that we are the common government. And when we do that, we have our narrative. We do not have the Israeli narrative. We do not follow the Palestinian narrative. We are the government in this simulation. We are the government of the entire area. And as the government of the entire area, we have our own opinion, our own narrative. I expect to have a rigorous discussion and I hope that it would be very, very respective of each, we will be respective of each other. So that it's clear, we do not preclude other formulas. Any other formula is, uh, we, we are not precluding it. We are saying, however, that our formula is, our, is the best formula, but we are not claiming exclusivity. In other words, we do not oppose other formulas and other people to pursue other formulas. We will ask Mona, and uh, Mona, I hope it's okay for me to call you Mona. You can call me Joe. It's, it's okay. Um, could the IPC formula attain peace? That's the criteria for judging the plan. Could the IPC formula attain peace? Is the IPC plan implementable? These are the three criteria. Could it make peace? Is it implementable? And is there a downside to either the Israeli or the Palestinians? In other words, let's say we create this common government and 
is there a downside to the Israelis or the Palestinians if there is a common government? These are the questions we would like uh, Mona to respond to. Um, we are demonstrate, we are proposing legislation. We are proposing a constitution. So that you understand, we are not the government. I think it's clear, we are not the government. We are only pretending to be the government. And what we are demonstrating today is for, purpose, is for demonstration purposes only. We think that there will, could be a lot more legislation and there is a lot more legislation, but we don't have the time to show all the legislation that could make peace. But we are asking you to look at the big picture, avoid technical arguments if possible and refrain from comments. Um, again, this is not a lecture, this is a simulation. So we're asking you to ask questions and refrain from comments. You can use the chat feature for your comments and you can make your comments at the end. But we're asking for you to ask substantive questions regarding what's being presented to you. So what's the difference between a question and a, simula and a comment? If I show you a picture of the airplane and you say, Joe, Joseph, how does this thing fly? That's a question, that's fine. We encourage questions, we want you to ask questions. But if you say airplanes cause pollutions and airplanes are dangerous and I will never board an airplane, that's a comment. Please refrain from your comment, use the chat feature for the comment or use it at the end. Uh, because again, this is not a lecture, this is a simulation. We are just simulating, we're trying to show you how it could work. So I hope that's clear. Um, certain things we need to assume and accept in order for this simulation to work. The Israeli prime minister represents Israelis only. He's only elected by Israelis. Palestinian leaders represent Palestinians only. I think we all agree to that. However, we are asking you to assume certain to make certain assumptions. And Mona would be free to criticize, or all of you would be free to criticize those assumptions. If those assumptions are realistic, then I think the government that we are proposing is realistic. So we want you to assume that there was an online election for the entire people of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem, 14 million people that it lasted not one day, not one week, but three months. And today is April 10, and today the three months um, have passed. That the election allowed 14 million people with the exclusion of minors, of course, but generally 14 million people are allowed to vote in Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and Jerusalem. I also want you to assume that 5 million people voted that 3 million Palestinians voted and 2 million Israelis voted. These, this is, these are the assumptions. I also want you to receive, assume that the president, that I, Joseph, was elected as president. And so that you, it's clear, I do not intend to run for president, but it makes it easier for me to facilitate this conversation if we pretend that I was elected by one and a half million vote, that a Palestinian <laughs> lady was elected by 1.3 million votes, and I will serve as president for the first two years, she will pretend she will be vice president after uh, the two years, and I will become, I'm sorry, she will become president, and I will become vice president after two years. I also want you to assume that 300 parliament members were elected. And I'm gonna ask most of you or all of you that are not going to be leaders and you'll see how it works to be either Israeli or Palestinian parliament members. But the parliament members represent their districts only. They, you do not, the parliament members are not representative of the entire people of Palestine or Israel. They only represent their district. 
47,000 people. So these are the assumptions that I want you to make. And I'm gonna ask you, do you have any questions regarding those assumptions? Go ahead and shout your question. And do you have any substantive questions about the assumptions? Uh, and also I'll ask uh, Mona, Mona, are, are you willing to accept those assumptions? Uh, I'm willing to accept the assumptions uh, for purposes of today's simulation. And I wanna thank you of course for inviting me and I look forward to engaging with all of you. Um, okay. whether, whether this is the right time to make suggestions about the assumptions or whether you prefer if I wait for my five minutes, I'm happy to wait till my five minutes. Well, I, I want you to tell me, do you think these assumptions are realistic? Can they be converted into reality? Um, in your opinion? I, I believe they are. However, to the extent that you're making assumptions, uh, theoretically anyway, I would advise you to alter one assumption. And okay, that let's, assumption- Let's go back to the assumption, which one? The, le the level of participation. Uh, okay. While I believe 5 million is a rather realistic level and, and a laudable level of participation given the level of participation in other democracies, realistically speaking, to the extent that you're seeking to promote this concept, and to ensure that there's tractionability, acceptability, credibility with a wider stakeholder community in terms of the realisticness of the, of the proposal, then your assumption may be well served with a higher level of participation, something closer to the 50% uh, of, 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 the, of the 14 million, um, not because that's in real, in real terms, the level of voting but the level of support that you would have in order to gain the credibility you need to uh, make this more than just an idea and, and something that is potentially translatable into reality, that you show that you have that level of support within the two communities. Okay, so are you saying that if 5 million people voted, that's not going to translate into a political, uh, power to start forcing the Israeli and the Palestinian governments to accept the legislation that we are proposing? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I'm saying that it would be seen as the as still sort of the dream of the most well-meaning members of the two communities, the most um, ready to compromise members of the community. If you wanna have real traction, I think you, you, you should bifurcate the assumption. Those who support the concept and may be willing to register to vote versus those who actually participate in the voting. Because when you look at statistics worldwide and democracies, the number of those who register to vote is always higher than those who actually vote. I see that your 5 million is a realistic number. 30% is rather high actually, based on performances around the world. But you would at least want a higher number registering, showing support for the concept. So maybe your assumptions can reflect support versus actual participation and give you greater credibility in, in, in socializing your concept and gaining support for your concept. Okay. Um, you know, I checked to see what is the level of participation in elections in Israel and in Palestine. And I realized that it's actually almost the same. It's the low, the almost the lowest number is sixty percent in Palestine vote in the elections and in Israel, but sometimes it's a higher percentage. In other words, what I'm trying to to say, Mona, is that um, Palestinians and Israelis like to vote. They like the democracy. They like to vote. Right, but what you have here is a thirty percent participation rate. Correct. So, so that doesn't reflect the reality. And the reality is actually more advantageous to your ability to gain traction with stakeholders if the, if the number is higher. So what you said actually supports my recommendation that you consider raising the assumption to closer to 50 to 60% would be really welcome. Okay. All right. Well, that's good news. 
Okay, so does anyone else have any questions regarding those assumptions? Um, I believe that those assumptions could become realistic. I just want to remind everyone that a war between Israel and Gaza, one day of war is over $100 million per day. And if we are able to, um, to invest a total of $100 million on the entire election, including the publicity for it and, and public relation for it and supporting the candidates, it's going to be $100 million would be, would make those assumptions a lot more realistic, in my opinion. Okay, so now we are into the more practical part of the simulation. I'm going to be asking some of you to um, choose your nationality, either you are Palestinian or Israeli, but I first need to have a volunteer to act as uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Do I have a Prime Minister of Israel volunteer to act in I this vol team? I volunteer. Len, okay. You volunteer before you are, a, I think, a, a, have a good discussion. So you, Ellen is the Israeli prime minister. Do we have a Hamas leader? I would do that. Okay. And do we have a PA leader? A volunteer for pa Palestinian Authority president. I need a PA leader, please. I can I can be a Giacomo here. Okay, Giacomo, terrific. Okay, the rest of you will have to choose um, and be and remain. Uh, try to be as honest as you can with yourself are, and with us. Are you Israeli or Palestinian parliament member? Remember, there are 300 districts. Each district is represented. It, it, each district includes 47,000 people. So I'll, I, I'll show you a map. And you can choose if you want to be a leader, uh, a, 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 a parliament member uh, from Gaza or from Jerusalem or from Tel Aviv or Hadera or Netanya or Nablus or Tulkarem or Jericho, whatever. Uh, just decide in your own head. But if, and some of the district remember, like you could be in Jerusalem and you could be, uh, your district could be mixed, Israeli and Palestinian. You can be in um, Gaza in the border of Gaza and your district would be mixed, Israeli and Palestinian. So just decide in your own head, because I may ask you later on, who do you represent? So let's do a, an experiment and uh, just to try to see how many voters we have. Let's have the Palestinian voters vote first so that we know how it works and how many we have. So. Palestinian, please vote first. Palestinian parliament member. Okay. Okay, let's end the polling. We have 10 Palestinian parliament members. And let's have now Israeli parliament members. Please vote. Okay, and we have nine Israeli, Israeli, it's good. That's a good proportion. Okay, so let's uh, share the results. So we are starting and, and you know, 
as as this thing goes along, you may decide to join the Israeli or the Palestinian, but please stay within your uh, within your decision so that it's clear the Israeli prime minister, Hamas leaders, and the PA are not allowed to vote. They are a different government. They are a separate government. But the parliament members, the Israeli and the Palestinian parliament members are allowed to vote uh, because they are part of the government, of a, the, the common government and the common parliament. Okay, so let's go to the first issue and that's the constitution. Um, we have a two page constitution. This really is an explanation of the constitution. It's not the actual text of the government, but it's an explanation of it. Um, is Libby here? Can Libby, can you read the first page, please? We believe that Palestinians and Israelis are entitled to equal rights under the law and guaranteed human rights and freedom. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation does not intend to supersede or supplant the Palestinian or Israeli government, nor to abrogate or undermine any agreements between those governments. We recognize the need to work with the Israeli and Palestinian governments. Our purpose is to resolve conflicts and to expand the relationship between Palestinians and Israelis in a fair and equitable manner. We believe in equal rights under the law, guaranteed human rights and freedom for all. Okay, so before we go to pay, second page, I just want to give some explanation here. We, we are not against the Israeli or the Palestinian government. We do not intend to undermine those. And, and we do not intend to undermine any agreements between those two governments. They can agree to whatever they want, including two states or one state or other, other formulas or other issues. We constitutionally, we are not allowed to undermine those agreements. So let's go to page two. Libby, can you read page two? We voluntarily give the legislatures and the governments of Israel and Palestine veto power over legislation we pass relating to the domain of control of those governments. We believe in the separation of power between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. We believe in the creation of a permanent secular government for all the people residing in Israel and Palestine. We believe in having a separate judicial branch relating to IPC legislation with Israeli and Palestinian judges with a system to avoid biased decisions based on nationality. Okay, so the key here is that if we pass legislation that has to do with the domain and control of either the Israeli or the Palestinian government, we say you are allowed, the Israeli and the Palestinian government, you have a veto power over those legislation. We cannot pass legislation that has to do with your domain and control unless we give you a veto power. If you fail to veto it, then it becomes law. But if you veto it, it does not become law. And this is what we are going to exercise, simulate today. So let's, well, first of all, does anyone have any questions regarding uh, this constitution? I could pose not, a question here. Not comments, but con questions. Question, yes. And with respect to the judicial branch, since we are blessed with the presence of Mona Ali Khalil today, I would ask uh, the question, in the, uh, const in the constitution of a judicial branch, it has been proposed that there would be one Israeli judge, one Palestinian judge, but I find that problematic because they could not uh, necessarily come to a common consensual decision. So, okay, so to overcome such a, could, could it uh, 
be possible to uh, have a trilateral commission instead with one Israeli judge, one Palestinian judge, and then they both would choose a third judge, even from an international pool of judges, to make it a, uh, uh, a three-person uh, trilateral commission to avoid any blockage. Okay, so the way we have the avoid bias based on nationality is very simple. In order to decide against a Palestinian, we need to have majority Palestinian judges. In order to decide against Israelis, we need to have majority Israeli judges. And according to the constitution, they could each go to their own judicial system and appeal the decision. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let's take a vote on the constitution. Um, do you support the Israeli Palestinian parliament members only? Please vote. Do you support this constitution? This is for Palestinian parliament members only. Okay, let's publish the vote. 11, actually more than we had before, but 11 out of 11 Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this constitution. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members, please vote. Okay, let's end the polling. Uh, we had nine Israelis, but here we only have eight, but eight out of eight voted in favor of the constitution. So let's stop sharing, congratulations. We have a constitution. Uh, and let's go to our, our, our first issue, and that is granting a veto power. Uh, the Confederation is the government of the entire population of Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. I'm sorry, uh, Libby, could you please read this? Sure. Uh, okay, you already read the first one. Yeah, so we yeah. hereby bestow a veto power relating to legislation affecting sovereignty to the following. The government of Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas. Right, so this is our own declaration. It's not part of the constitution. We have a government, we have a president, I'm the president, we have a parliament, and now we want to move forward. And I am proposing this declaration to grant the veto power. Does anyone have questions regarding this declaration? Yeah. It, Mona has her hand up. Okay. Uh, I see Mona raised her hand. Do you have a question, Mona? Uh, just a marker that I intend to take issue with the veto to Hamas during my comments. Okay, so are you asking why are we giving it or are we asking why, why the governments of Israel and Palestine do not have a veto over that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned as an international lawyer where a sovereign entity is one sovereign, that Israel has one veto, whereas the Palestinian side has two vetoes, which doesn't seem to be equal. Moreover, uh, while there's clear legislative uh, representational capacity on the part of Hamas, the sovereign authority rests with whichever government represents Palestine. There should be one for each side. I have full recognition of the situation on the ground that may require what I would suggest be taking into account the views of the Hamas leadership. But to, to give one side one veto and the other side two vetoes already violates the equality of the, the, the two peoples. And it also violates the sovereignty of the Palestinian side because there should be one sovereign, one territorial unit, West Bank and Gaza, which is what the law and the peace agreements between the two sides demand. Okay, so the response to that is that we see all these as three entities as obstacles to peace. The Israeli government, 
the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Unfortunately, we have to deal with them. And if we decide to ignore them, we are not going to be able to achieve what we want, and that is to serve the people of Israel and Palestine and to have access to all the people of Israel and Palestine. So we believe that in order to do that, we need to give them veto power because if we do, if we ignore them, they would become our enemy and we will not be able to uh, achieve anything in either Israel, the West Bank and Hamas and Gaza. Okay, so, so this does not, we do not give a veto power to the Israeli or the Palestinian governments on this declaration because it does not affect their sovereignty, their, their domain and control. Let's take a vote on this uh, um, declaration. Uh, Palestinian parliament members, please vote. Do you support the declaration of ten veto power? Okay. So let's publish the vote. Um, eight out of uh, 10 voted yes. So it passed the Palestinian side. Let's go uh, have the Israeli parliament members vote. Do you support the declaration to intend to grant the veto power? Okay, uh, let's uh, end the polling. And on the Israeli side, uh, it did not pass. Five out of seven voted no. So let's uh, let's ask those who voted no to identify yourself. Uh, one of you, could you identify yourself? You voted no. Could you, Israeli parliament members, could you please identify who you are? Yes, uh, that's uh, me, Joseph. It's Amnon. I voted no because I happen to agree with what Mona said earlier, that even though uh, Hamas and the, the Palestinian Authority are they are not united, and we cannot consider them as two separate entities because they are Palestinians altogether. Okay. And if, if something if something like this happens, where the two of them get together to veto. Uh, something that the Israeli part of it agreed to, then any Israeli decision will never pass. So I think I think Hamas and the Palestinians should have one veto between them. So it will be equal. Okay, but uh, you are aware that uh, there are they have a, a a very strong rift between them. And my question to you. First of all, what is your district? Where do you represent? Which what city do you represent? Tel Aviv. Okay. So, um, how do you intend, as the parliament member, how do you intend for us, the common government, to have access to the two million people in Gaza if we if we do not give Hamas a veto power? By making the Palestinians in Gaza realize that the importance of this uh, uh, constitution and the organization and making sure that they, their, their goal and motive is peace, they will come to the realization, hopefully, that they need to unite and put away the rift that they have with the... Okay, but, we are, but they are not united. We need to deal with today not with aspiration for the future. You have 60% unemployment in Gaza. You have Gaza under siege. You have, uh, so if you just hope, that's not what we, we want to deal with reality right now. Okay, do we have another uh, uh, Israel, Israeli parliament member who voted against giving- Joseph, can I just provide a clarification for my comment? Since uh, it seems to have had some some traction with with the uh, uh, members participating, 
uh, less than 30 seconds, I promise. Yeah, sure, sure. Go, go ahead. Okay. You are the guest of honor. <laughs> <laughs> now, the idea is not to deprive them of a voice. You can give Hamas a voice without giving them a veto. We do recognize the situation on the ground and they should have a voice and the people impacted by the various <clears throat> special circumstances and rather dire circumstances for, for the people in Gaza. But the people in Gaza did not vote for Hamas. The Palestinian people elected Hamas <clears throat> in, in, in legislative elections several years ago and that gives them a legitimacy that should be respected. Not because they're a de facto authority in Gaza, but because they were duly elected as the legislative organ. But again, the legislative organ is not the sovereign organ and that, and that principle must be preserved to ensure equality, but also the sovereignty of the Palestinian state. So by okay, all but, means, give them a voice, yeah. but don't give them a veto. Okay, but, but, but in reality, from my perspective, I am the president of the whole area. I have 2 million people in Gaza. I want to give them prosperity. I want to give them employment. And all of you, parliament members, also want to give the people in Gaza uh, uh, the, the uh, prosperity and be able to travel and end the siege. And I believe Hamas is in control. I cannot enter uh, Gaza without Hamas uh, authorization. So who else voted against giving Hamas a veto power? Uh, Joseph, it's Amnon again. One, one no, quick... no, let's go to another. I want another parliament member. You voted against it. I'm not going to convince you. I want to see someone else logic. And I, uh, I abstained and I'd like to change my vote in favor because... Um, okay, thank I, you. I think, can I say why? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I agree that, that it seems unequal to have two veto powers among the Palestinians, but um, the, fact, the fact is that requiring them to come, requiring the West Bank and Gaza to come to an agreement on their veto, I think would be uh, counterproductive more so than um, having, having an imbalance of having two vetoes on the Palestinian side. I, I think that would just lead to, you know, basically a non-functioning uh, system. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. And is there anyone else who voted no veto to Hamas and, and want hey, to- uh, I did. I'm, my name's Anna. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about this process, um, and I would just say that I think if Palestine has two, then perhaps we include an extra region of Israel that also tends to have its own unique characteristics and give Judea and Samaria a veto power as well. If Hamas gets one, they get one. Look, I, I am the president. I have no problem getting into Judea and Samaria. They are not... Um, I, they are not blocking me from entering. They are not under siege. They are not, they don't have, uh, they have an airport that they can use. They have a seaport that they can use. The, the reason I want to give Hamas a veto power is because they control 2 million people. And I am the president of the whole area. I want to be able to deliver to my people in Gaza. So, and I am able to give, to deliver to the Palestinian and Israel, Israel in the West Bank, but I'm not able to deliver to the people in Gaza because Hamas controls it. So I don't want to turn Hamas into my enemy. I want to work with Hamas. So let's take a vote, see if maybe you changed your mind. Let's have the Israeli vote again. Israelis. Okay, and let's publish the vote. Share the, okay, so now it's 50. We need 55%, we're very close. <laughs> Could we get uh, one other person, no, but not Amnon, not uh, uh, someone else. I wanna convince you of the 50% who voted no. Could you please identify yourself and 
and tell us why you voted no. Joseph, may I say just 10 seconds? I voted in both times uh, for the for the registration. And the reason is very simple, because any side, doesn't matter how many you will part it, any side will vote with his, his own interests. <laughs> And, and therefore, and therefore, otherwise, it's, it's a kind of a check of balance that they make with themselves and, uh, and they decide according. So it doesn't matter how many uh, will do there, uh, okay. will be there. Okay. Do we have someone who voted no out of the 50% who is willing to identify yourself? Um, Jeffrey's raising his hand, Jeffrey Goldstein. Jeffrey, okay. can you unmute, please? And Okay. Jeffrey, sure. could you tell us? Um, why you voted no against giving Hamas a veto power? Well, if you look at the situation right now, uh, there's there's two different sides, and the two sides, if they if each side has a veto power, then it's more balanced. And you may say that uh, the, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas aren't together now, but maybe next week they'll be together, and so. The, okay. the, that gives them too much power. Yeah, and but we can change the legislation when they are together. This is, not, this is not in set in stone. It's not part of the Constitution. So if they are together, we can change the legislation and give them one veto power. But in reality, right now, they are not. And you have, and by the way, what district do you represent, Jeffrey? Uh, Jerusalem. Okay. Jerusalem. Okay. So, uh, Joseph, may I uh, make uh, a proposal? Uh, instead of talking about specific uh, uh, entities having veto powers, could we uh, pre uh, preface this with uh, a mention of what is actually the real issue, which is territorial control? These three entities were chosen because they are the ones that have actual control over the territory we are talking Correct. about. Correct. Correct. So. Maybe we could clarify this in a statement that comes before uh, identifying these three entities and, uh, and also specify that the, the number of entities given a veto power can be changed at any time at a unilateral decision by, by the parliament on the basis of developments on the ground. This maybe okay. might help uh, reduce con concerns and, and, uh, and stuff like that. All right. So let's take a one more vote, and that will be the final vote on the Israeli side. See if we change minds. Mona would like to say a word also. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you... uh, Joseph, I don't want to interrupt your procedure. I'm happy to wait till after the vote. Yeah, okay. But it may impact the vote, so. It's okay, go ahead, go ahead, speak. Uh, okay, so basically, I, 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 I'm very impressed with the, with the nuances that are being tweaked out in this discussion. I, I understand that there will be a need to implement the decision and the practical territorial control that Hamas may have or that the settlers may have or that any entity in the future may have may impede the implementation, but we should separate the decision-making from the implementation. And I think for two reasons, you may wanna reconsider the assumption of granting or the declaration of granting Hamas an equal veto. Uh, I think it would read much better for the purpose of your equality to say government of Israel, government of Palestine, first of all. Secondly, um, and I promise not to go over 30 seconds as, as usual, uh, Hamas, if it vetoes a bill that both government of Palestine and government of Israel have accepted, um, there's no reason to assume Hamas and the PA will vote the same way. They're, they're usually quite divided. And you would be denying yourself the legitimacy of a legislation that has the support of 55% of your Palestinians and Israeli members of the Confederation, the support of the government of Israel, the support of the government of Palestine, just because Hamas says no. Now, yeah. so that's one reason not to give them a veto. The other is if you have a decision adopted with the approval of the two governments and Hamas refuses to cooperate with the implementation, how much greater is your ability to leverage the implementation of the legislation if you have at least passed the legislation with the support of those two majorities and of the two governments? So it's just something to think about. 
No, I agree. I, I, yeah, that, so after this simulation, um, send me um, a proposed text for the uh, granting of veto power. All right, let's go to the next issue. So here we see how um, we almost got it. Uh, let's go to the next. This is this is actually giving a veto power. Um, and that's the first legislation that we are going to pass um, uh, that does give a veto power. Let's have the, uh, uh, Libby, can you read it, please? Teaching tolerance and understanding. Both educational systems to teach tolerance in their public schools. Devote a certain number of hours for both sides to teach the history of the Israelis and the Palestinians. Prioritizing teaching Arabic and Hebrew in public schools to achieve proficiency of both languages by Israeli and Palestinian students. Create a mutual task force to ensure the teaching of both languages. Educators to draft textbooks together and arrange for a regular exchange of teachers. Public media on both sides to provide fair and equal coverage daily for teaching tolerance. IPC as the facilitator to ensure that both sides are fairly represented. And we hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government, the Palestinian government, and Hamas. We bestow upon them a veto power which may be exercised in the next 60 days. All right, so we need to move a little faster. So I'm not gonna ask you if you have questions, I'm just gonna have a vote. Can we have the Palestinian parliament members please vote on this legislation? Okay, uh, you published a vote, um, 10 out of 10, what we had, uh, so, Really, a hundred percent voted yes. Let's have the Israeli parliament members vote. Do you support teaching tolerance and understanding? Okay. Um, let's publish the vote. Eight out of eight voted yes. So let's stop sharing. And let's go to Mona and ask uh, for your comments regarding this legislation. Thank you, Joseph. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I have comments on the Constitution as well, but I'll save those for the five minutes allotted after the after the uh, after the uh, legislations. Um, I, I fully strongly not only support this legislation, but applaud you and, and, and pay tribute to you for having it. I do believe, however, that there is a need to avoid anything that's mandatory. So I like the fact that you're using prioritizing because people's freedom to choose should, should be respected. Uh, we should encourage mutual dialogue in each other's languages. We should encourage mutual understanding of each other's narratives. We should uh, uh, be able to share lived experiences from both sides. And that is, is certainly uh, the starting point of tolerance. Tolerance isn't just about lip service to the equality and dignity. It's the actual willingness to accept, even if, if it means um, disagreeing, but nonetheless being willing to hear and willing to accept that somebody has a different experience and a different circumstance and has a different understanding of terms, historical and current. Um, so it, while I fully support the constitution's assumptions not to look back and point fingers, we nonetheless have continuing ongoing violations, disproportionately by one side than the other, but violations by both sides. Um, that are very real and very current. They're not historical, they're not narrative, they're not storytelling. They're, they're very real things that are being endured and suffered as we speak. So that ability to have that conversation has to allow for that narrative to be heard and to be understood and to be embraced even if it's not fully agreed with by either side. So the, the mother who's lost 
a child to a terrorist act, needs to empathize with the mother who's lost a child to an Israeli raid in the middle of the night. That equality of human suffering, where no side has a monopoly on rights and no side has a monopoly on wrongs, is essential to the successful evolution of this concept. And I applaud you for recognizing that. I still maintain my reservations about the veto to Hamas um, and think it's a really bad idea. But uh, nonetheless, I, I support the legislation itself. Mona, um, I'm, I'm not really expecting you. Well, I am. But to me, more important is I think we have shown that a common government is the only vehicle to create this kind of legislation. And what I'm asking you is to comment about the process of creating a common government, which could come up with legislation that would be beneficial to both sides. Whether or not it's, it's, it's a good legislation, I think it's clear it's a good legislation. No, no one in his right mind is gonna oppose that. <laughs> but the concept itself. I agree with you completely that it is a good concept. It's a noble concept and it's a worthy concept. But um, and if you get 55% of Palestinians and 55% of Israelis, which I believe you can today with today's Israelis and today's Palestinians. And I believe you could even get the Israeli government and the Palestinian government to accept it. But on that day, you're going to give Hamas a veto and they're going to say no. And that means you're depriving all of us of the possibility of turning that hypothetical legislation into a reality. And that I, I would not accept. Well, if Hamas veto it, then there are tools to expose them. Or not only Hamas, but you, you know, I forgot. I forgot. Let's do the let's do the veto right now. Let's have the uh, let's 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 practice the veto. Um, Hamas leader, are you going to veto yes. this legislation? As the legitimate government, elected government of Palestine, Hamas does not veto this legislation, and has. Uh, amended its uh, charter of 1988 to uh, refuse any discrimination against Jewish people and has adopted a new charter in 2011. Please take note. Thank you. Uh, the Palestinian Authority president, are you going to veto this legislation? Uh, no, I won't veto it, but I suggest that perhaps we have a committee of Israeli and Palestinian experts who could perhaps vet to make sure that uh, both sides are sticking to the agreement. Right, that's the technical aspect of it. I, no problem. And let's go to the Israeli prime minister. Are you going to veto this legislation? Uh, no, I'm not. But also I'd like to comment the same as Hamas has commented. The world at the moment recognizes the PA as representing the Palestinian people. The PA and Hamas are both, are both political parties, not governments. Our PA is, represents a government and the PA may end up taking over the whole place or Hamas may take over the whole place. But it's the, it's the Palestinian government. It's not a political party called Hamas or the PLO that represents uh, everybody. And I think Mona is certainly right on that point. Uh, I do think that creating textbooks will be kind of difficult, if not impossible. And you certainly can not control the uh, news media. So you cannot ensure fairness anywhere in the, in the news media. You can't now and you won't be able to in the future and nor should you, because you should not control it. Okay. Uh, aside from that, I agree with Mona's attitude. There should be one person representing, but I will not veto it. All right, let's go to the next legislation, redrawing the wall. Um, call on Israel to redraw the wall in certain locations in order to reduce hardship on both the Palestinian and Israeli people while maintaining security for both. We hear... I'm sorry, Libby, I tell you, we hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government, the Palestinian government, and Hamas. We bestow upon them a veto power. So let's go to the Palestinian parliament members. Please vote. 
Do you support the legislation to redraw the wall? Okay. Let's end the polling. 85%, 11 out of 13 voted yes. Uh, stop. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Let's end the polling. Um, a 78% of those who voted voted yes. Uh, let's go to the um, Hamas leader. Uh, Mr. Hamas leader, are you going to veto this legislation? No, not necessary. Let's go to the um, PA president. Are you going to veto this legislation? No. Let's go to the Israeli prime minister. Are you going to veto this legislation? Yes, of course. I'm not having anybody else be responsible for my security. We've lived with years of terrorism, which is a reason the wall was built in the first place. And uh, that's the reason for it. And so I'm not having you tell, tell me where to put the wall or to have a wall at all. If there's peace, there's no reason to have a wall, period. There was no wall since between 1967 and 2000. Everybody traveled back and forth to work, play and shop. So we didn't have a wall then. We may, we, hopefully we won't need, need a wall in the future. But in the meantime, uh, Nobody's going to impose on me how to protect the people. Okay, but it is possible to redraw the wall in certain location to reduce the hardship. And we can also add a Israeli Palestinian Confederation police to help reduce the hardship. If well, we no, we, we also could be uh, uh, redrawing the wall to. Uh, to uh, provide better security and uh, control terrorism. And the wall may be expanded in that case. And yeah. certainly uh, the but, IPC but, police have no right to step in there. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister, are you aware, I'm sure you are aware that the wall is wide open, that there are many, many ways if, if people want to get in and they do get in. Yes. So, so, so your claim of security is completely hollow. Because, excuse me, excuse me. Because the wall, the... Let, let me finish. The wall is interfering with innocent citizens uh, movement. The wall, is it, in, the wall is also interfering with terrorism. And uh, that's my responsibility is to keep the Israeli people safe. OK. I have, no, I have no problem moving walls if we need walls. I would like to remove the walls altogether. But you remove the walls altogether when you remove the terrorism altogether. Okay, let's go to Mona and get her opinion regarding what you've just seen. Um, yeah, I don't want to get involved with your discussion uh, between each other. However, uh, before I do that, I would talk about the, 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 the flaw in the legislation. Uh, of course, one point of agreement with the Israeli prime minister is that indeed we look forward to the day when the wall in its entirety can be removed. Until that day comes, we must ensure not only for the sake of hardship, because there's tremendous amount of loss and hardship and even loss of lives because of various checkpoints and other things and along the wall, uh, but because it's against international law. The International Court of Justice has deemed in several respects this wall constitutes grave violations of the Geneva Conventions, not just violations, grave violations of the Geneva Conventions because it does not follow the territory that is internationally recognized as being part of Israel and Israel's right to self-defense. But you cannot defend yourself on somebody else's territory. You defend yourself on your own territory. And the wall should be moved to comply with what Israel itself has declared it to be what Israel exists in the pre-67 borders. Uh, where it's not, then it needs to be redrawn immediately, not as a matter of charity to the Palestinians, but as a matter of accountability for Israel's compliance with international law, with the resolutions of the Security Council and General Assembly, and with the judgment, the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Now, that is an advisory opinion. However, the advisory opinion itself contains refer references 
to customary international law. So those parts, those ergo omnis and jus cogens principles that are recognized there are binding, even if it's in the context of an advisory opinion. So I think the legislation would be stronger if it's based on those legal principles and legal obligations rather than on the hardship of the Palestinians, which exists with or without the wall because of the occupation. Um, so Mona, you responded regarding the substance of the legislation, but I would like you to think about the common government uh, putting, uh, 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 exposing that issue altogether because that issue is not really being discussed. Mm -hmm. So the common government is could be, in my opinion, a good vehicle to bring this issue and to reach a, a some sort of consensus, as you see. I mean, there is a consensus right now, the Prime Minister of Israel, mm -hmm. but basically exposing the whole the, the whole issue. Absolutely. No, and the legislation is necessary. If the confederation itself is going to be consistent with, compliant with, promoting of international law, it would be incumbent upon the confederation to ensure either the elimination of the wall or the redrawing of the wall to its legal boundaries. Um, this is, I think, a, a, a part of the raison d'etre of the, of the confederation, as you have said it. If you're going to be seeking equal rights, equal dignity, equal security, equal justice for both sides, then certainly these violations, these grave violations of international law must come to an end. And the Confederation calling for that would be fully consistent with your goals and with your uh, provisions and your constitution. Okay, let's go to the next, because uh, no, we're running uh, out of time. I, I really would like to say something here because I believe we're getting a lot of disinformation. Len, Len, we want to move on. We want to move well, on. Well, I'm would... sorry. I'm sorry. We are listening I'd to like a to lawyer. Hear. Yes, you'd like to hear. Under international law, Israel includes everything that was part of the British mandate for Palestine. That is international law. And I would suggest, instead of shaking your head, madam, I have, I have just as good credentials as you have. I suggest you read Article 80 of the UN, of the UN Constitution uh, which every single member of the UN has caused, and the International Court of the International Criminal Court is is a huge violator of uh, Israel's human rights. They have no right to make their pronouncements, and uh, under international law, if the, if there is going to be a Palestinian state, it will be not because we are not here to to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. No, for. but we're, if we're discussing okay. international we're not law, here. this is not the to... forum. This is not the forum for that. We Let's are move here. On. This is the forum right. for the uh, Israeli Palestinian Confederation simulation. That's the forum. So that we are going to the next issue, which Mona wanted me to discuss, and I think it's a good, is the next legislation. This hold legislation. On, on, Joseph, Joseph, I just, I just want to clarify and assure the Israeli Prime Minister of one, one, one issue. I did not refer to the International Criminal Court. I understand that Israel is not a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. It has signed it, but it is not a party to it. I'm talking about the International Court of Justice, which is, as far as I know, recognized by Israel as the supreme judicial body of the United Nations system. And it has issued an advisory opinion. And what I have said about it is, fully consistent with that opinion. Feel free to read it yourself and reach your own conclusions. Okay. As for the article uh, of the charter that you cited, article of any article of the charter must be read consistently with the, uh, the provisions of the charter that talk about self-determination, that talk about respecting and promoting international law. Nothing in what I said is contrary to that. Nothing in what I said violates Israel's right to exist in its sovereign borders and to have the right of self-defense. We're talking about okay. the wall right. that goes beyond its borders and that goes beyond its self-defense. All right, let's go that's, to the next. That's where the conflict wait, 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 is. Wait, 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 wait. We are done with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We are here to simulate an Israeli-Palestinian confederation. The next issue is return of all Palestinian refugees. This is. This is a legislation that was proposed by Nasir. I don't think he's here. Nasir, are you here? 
Um, no, he's not here. He's a Palestinian. Uh, he participated in many. So he, this is legislation. Uh, 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 Libby, could you read this legislation that is proposed by Nasir? Return of all Palestinian refugees. Calling on Palestine and Israel not hinder or block any measure or process to remedy any past injustice, specifically the right of return to all Palestinian refugees and their descendants to Palestine as full and equal citizens protected by law, as well as provide said refugees sufficient financial support to settle in their country. Additionally, the IPC recognizes the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people to create a viable, independent, and secure Palestinian state. Palestinian self-determination does not prevent or invalidate any work to bring about a more unified entity between, Israeli, between Israel and Palestine through democratic and diplomatic means in the future. We hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government, the Palestinian government, and Hamas. We bestow upon them a veto power, which may be exercised in the next 60 days. Okay, so in the, in the interest of time, uh, let's have the Palestinian parliament members please vote on this legislation. This is the total right of return to Palestinian refugees and their descendants. Okay, stop sharing. I mean, 11 out of 11, 100% of the Palestinian parliament members. Let's have the Israeli parliament members vote. Israeli parliament members. Okay, uh, and the polling, 60% are of Israeli parliament members are against this legislation. So uh, I prepared another legislation, just in interest of time, we're not gonna have, it didn't pass, so I prepared another legislation. Joseph, Joseph it passed. Oh, it did? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I was too anxious to present my own. Okay, so terrific. So let's go to Mona. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Let's go to the uh, Hamas leader. Are you gonna veto this legislation? I can only follow the uh, op-eds uh, printed by Hamas in the New York Times and Washington Post declaring it's the willingness to engage with Israel in a mutual and reciprocal manner for the recognition of each party. Are However, you going to veto this legislation? No, that means so I cannot veto this legislation for okay. that purpose. However, okay. the return of the refugees to their original homes is a matter that would be subject to further discussion and uh, oper operative procedures okay. by forming a federation in which the resident Palestinians would not necessarily be voting for the Israel government, but the, would vote for the Palestine government irrespective of their residence. Okay, let's go to the PA leader. Are you going to veto this legislation? No. Okay, let's go to the Israeli prime minister. Are you going to veto this legislation? Yes. Okay, so let's go to the next legislation, which I am proposing on this issue. Compensation to Palestinian refugees. Original refugees are offered two options. Option one, return and $250,000 compensation. Option two, accepting compensation of 500,000 and waiving a right of return. We hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli and the Palestinian government for veto. Let's, in the interest of time, let's have the Palestinian parliament members. Are you gonna vote? Please vote on this. <laughs> Publish the results. Okay, let's have the Israeli parliament members vote. Publish the result. 
Okay, 57 voted, 57% voted yes. Let's have, uh, let's submit this to the Hamas leader. Are you gonna veto this legislation? Hamas respects the individual choice of Palestinians and will not veto this legislation, although it okay. does not uh, view it favorably. Okay, let's go to um, the PA leader. Are you gonna veto this legislation? No. Let's go to Israeli prime minister. Are you gonna veto this legislation? Yes, veto. Okay, and all right. So, um, Mr. Uh, prime minister, um, I am the president of the entire area. I noticed that you veto every legislation that has to do with the core issue of the refugees. And I was elected by Israelis and Palestinians. I see you as the enemy of peace. Oh, let's and, not do this again. Let's not do this again. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I see you as the enemy of peace and I am going to work hard worldwide for you to be removed as the prime minister of Israel because you are harming the people of Israel. And I'm going to, and the Palestinian people, because I think that reasonable legislation regarding refugees would make a lot of sense and will help uh, solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and will deal with the heart of the issue. So do I do I get a comment? Do I get to say anything? Are you including? Are you? Yeah, you do get to say it, but it doesn't really matter because I am a, the prime minister of the whole area. No, am, you, do not act like a dictator. Are you referring here just to Jewish refugees, or just to Arab refugees, or Jewish refugees? Are uh, you? Including I'm referring. This legislation is specifically for Palestinian refugees. The Palestinian refugees can go to the country of Palestine anytime there is a country of Palestine established. There is no such a thing as a right of return anywhere in the world. There's no such a thing unless it is offered by the country itself, such as Spain and Portugal and Finland have done for people that have, that have left for whatever reason that want to come back. There is no way that you are going to impose on Israel and at the moment, Israel legally includes the West Bank, Gaza, etc. You are not imposing on Israel to pay for refugees that happened in a war of genocide by the Arabs against the Jews. Uh, you do not expect Israelis to pay restitution to people who fled during the war of aggression. Okay, let's go to let's go to Mona. I the, the, more, the main thing is that you see the process, you see how it works, and it's not who is right and who is wrong. Mm -hmm. The idea is to demonstrate for you that there could be a, 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 a process for it to work. So I'm interested in right. your comments. Right. No, I mean, I, I think that the statement by the uh, uh, Israeli prime minister is reflective of, on one hand, reality that there are Jewish uh, citizens of various Arab countries that are themselves refugees and their rights should be taken into account. This requires, however, that they fit within the definition of refugee from the Refugee Convention, which is fleeing violence, fleeing uh, war, fleeing uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of definition is precisely what international law is about. Any Jewish uh, citizen of an Arab country who left in, in 67, which is where most of these uh, uh, situations arise, would be eligible for return, should they so wish. And in the absence of a right of return, which is inalienable under the Convention on Refugee Rights, would be entitled to some measure of compensation. I think you said 67, you meant 48? No, no I'm talking about the Israelis, citizens who were Arab citizens who fled for their lives if they felt physical persecution and violence within the meaning of the Convention on Refugees. I think the Israeli Prime Minister would have a right to advocate for those Jewish refugees if they fit within the definition of refugee of the Convention. Uh, noting that the Convention was amended you know, in between. However, however, the statement by the Israeli Prime Minister in this hypothetical simulation is 
doesn't even resemble the position of the Israeli government and any current Israeli prime minister who still support based on the resolutions of the UN and other negotiations between the US uh, governed by the US leadership of the negotiation between the Palestinians and the Israelis, a Palestinian state. Israel does not claim, has never claimed that it owns all of the West Bank and Gaza as the Israeli prime minister just stated. So if you're gonna be hypothetical and participate in a simulation, then at least try to approximate the statements of the existing uh, existing leadership um, uh, on, on the ground. Any more than I think that Hamas is gonna be as uh, accommodating as it has been in this simulation. So a measure of realism to, to all three positions would be more constructive to the simulation. Um, the UN uh, resolutions in large part are about creating two states living side by side in peace and security with equal dignity and rights for both peoples. It does not negate the rights of one people in favor of another. So please uh, uh, familiarize yourself with the actual position of the government of Israel, which is far more realistic and reasonable than the position we're hearing today. Well, I, I, I'm in favor of two-state solution. The Israeli government's in favor of two-state solution. And when two states are being established, the Palestinian state can bring in whoever they want. All right, Mona, are you, can you answer some of the, of the participants' questions? Yes, uh, just to point out, the right of return is inalienable. And it There's is no the right such a thing. Original... They made that up. Okay. No, I didn't. Read All the right, Convention let's... on Refugees. I'll put it in the chat box. Let's go to questions. The first person to ask a question would be uh, Charles and then Sean. And then you can raise your hand. I'll call you as necessary. Go ahead, Charles. Charles, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, fascinated by in this uh, simulation, these simulations, is that basically that I, that I don't really think we kind of address, but is implicit, is that um, power doesn't necessarily reside in the uh, use of force or in uh, the ability of a government to mandate this or that. It resides in the sense of the people about what is just and whether or not a given piece of legislation uh, passes on the first time, you know, if it increases the uh, awareness and the motivation amongst the majority of the population to start dealing with this situation psychologically in their adjustment to the world, then it's been a positive force. Now, the IPC, obviously, a lot of these types of legislation may not pass on the first go. Nevertheless, the uh, creation of the government and its continued efforts for one kind of legislation after another, after another, and then returning to something that didn't pass. I think it has to be uh, considered because e even, even in our dialogues here, you know, we've, we've gone around the circles between people who feel strongly in one position or another. And, and you know, we've, we've maybe shifted a little bit our positions in some respects. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And, 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 get, and get your reaction, Mona. Uh, if I, uh, is it my turn? Uh, Joseph has temporarily gone for a cup of coffee. <laughs> it's your uh, turn, okay. Mona. We want to hear from you. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, uh, I understand that Joseph has a whole, let's call them suite of resolutions, draft resolutions, draft legislations. Um, and that oftentimes we, we have the opportunity to look at one or two of them. Um, to the extent that these are passing, hypothetically, at least in the simulation, by more than 55%, they are passing. Um, but your question about whether or not it, there is merit or value in, in continuing to look at legislation that may be rejected, um, there will be opportunity to, if it, if it doesn't pass, uh, I think, the, the, the need to revisit it, you know, after a change of circumstance or after a greater awareness raising or after promoting certain understandings or certain rights 
and obligations under the law uh, could be beneficial because these are aspirational, obviously, aspirational legislations. And if it doesn't pass the first time, there's no need to give up. We can come, mm -hmm. come back. But coming back without building understanding, coming back without a change of circumstance may be futile and may actually achieve the opposite result, that there is no support for what you're saying. Rather than when you have a, a failure of passage, then build on understanding, educate about the rule of law, educate about human rights, educate about the added value of the legislation, and then revote, not just revote as a matter of revoting. Um, so oh, I think yeah, that- I agree. Be... Okay, yeah. let's, go that to, let's go to Sean. Sorry, I ran out of the question. There was a question I was gonna ask, but uh, for, forgot that question until it comes back. Okay, yeah, let, let, let me know. All right. Uh, if I can no use problem. the gap just to, to emphasize something, I, I when I spoke about the Jewish refugees, that is not without prejudice, of course, to the ultimate uh, uh, content of the legislation we just discussed, which is the Palestinian refugees. They, of course, have the same right as any refugee on, in the international community, a right to return to their homes. Um, it is not a right that is that is subject to the consent of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, new nation that may have replaced their homes. The, the new nation is recognized, its sovereignty is recognized, its self-defense is recognized, its demographic uh, concerns are also recognized, but that does not negate the right of return. As, as, as the legislation recognizes, most people would be willing to accept an alternative, such as compensation, such as a uh, possible residency. You can have residency the way the settlers can have residency and. Palestinian territory, if they're willing to recognize Palestinian sovereignty, uh, Palestinian refugees who wish to return to their original homes, subject to the recognition of the new sovereign, which is the Israeli government, should be able to apply for permanent residency or legal residency at least, and live in their original homes, albeit with, with the clear recognition that is now under a new sovereign, the, the Israeli sovereign. Settlers are also welcome. The settlers who believe that they have a religious uh, duty or right to live in Judea and Samaria can be, as long as they recognize that that territory is now as part of a Palestinian state. And if they want to live under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian state, should recognize the sovereignty of the Palestinian state and equally get some kind of legal or permanent residency as part of the Palestinian state. But those historical uh, rights and those historical narratives can be accommodated but they cannot be used to trump legal rights and legal obligations under existing international law, customary international law, including the Refugee Convention. There is um, no international law of return. You are making this up. You cannot it's in force the chat it. It is the chat box. Look at the chat box. I'm sorry. I would like something else. It's not fair what you're doing. It's not okay, fair. I would like you to can, just say one thing. We have an order here. You're not, you're not, you don't have any superior rights here, okay? We have an I order. Would, we have I an would order just like to, I have one comment. But I would like you to stop like calling I told you, Israelis. We're not here to, to, they are not we'll settlers, they're Israelis. Okay, we're not here to deal with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We certainly are doing it. Yeah, because you put, okay, let's go to Shiraz. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, first I want to congratulate the Israeli Prime Minister of using the term wall as, uh, as wall rather than as fence. So that's good, you now at least recognize the world. My, my question to Mona is, Israel, in Israel there is a mandatory military requirement that women should serve for two years and, and, uh, and train, and then men for three years. I don't know whether that, uh, that program trains the soldiers to be terrorists or whether they will be taught tolerant. But my question is, how do you look at the Israel uh, or Zionist uh, Palestinian conflict? Is it a race war or is it a religious war or anything else? Because the, the Israelis who support Zionism are strongly using the Bible. And there is so much hatred against the 
the Muslims and and also against the Palestinians is a race, even calling Palestinians only Arabs, but not saying the term Palestinian. So I'm just asking, because this whole issue of racism from anti-Semite, but not in terms of the Palestinians. So can you comment uh, uh, about the, whether it's a religious war and whether it is a racial war? And what is the army teaching? Was it teaching terrorism towards Palestinians or is it teaching tolerance? Thank you. Um, I, I, would have I, wanna, a, I wanna add to that question. Mm? Is it, I think it's a very good question. Is it possible in your opinion to have a common secular democratic government for the whole area of Israel and Palestine? Or is this out of the question? For me, the fundamental issue is the right of self-determination of both peoples, the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. And the Palestinian people, before there was an Israeli state, consisted of Jewish Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, and uh, Muslim Palestinians. So to me, it's not a religious divide. The Jewish people are a religion, but they're also a people within the definition of, of, of the right of self-determination and are entitled to the right of self-determination. The difference is that one side has its equal rights, its self-determination, its state, and the other side not yet. Now, there are many reasons why that other side, the Palestinian side, doesn't have full enjoyment of its human rights or of its uh, sovereign rights or of its uh, many other plethora of rights. Part self-inflicted, but a lot of it is because of the continuing occupation and the denial of certain fundamental rights. Now, both sides have a historical narrative. Both sides have religious affiliation to the, to the land. All sides have affiliation to Jerusalem and all can be accommodated, respected, reconciled, and, and uh, exercised and enjoyed by all peoples if and when there is peace if and when there's a mutual recognition of the mutual uh, self-determinant rights of, of both peoples. So to me, that is the proper framing that best uh, accommodates the Confederation. It does not uh, uh, do away with the two-state solution, but it builds on top of it, a mechanism by which not just two states and, and peace treaties, but true understanding, a true effort to work together for the betterment of both peoples, for the human rights of both peoples and for the peace and security and dignity of both peoples who are each, each really, which are both important. However, we should not hold that vision hostage by the extremists in both of our camps. We should be able to allow the majority, and I believe the overwhelming majority on both sides that wants to put human rights first, peace and security second, and the ability to live normal, peaceful lives for their children at the top of the of, of their human concern. And, and as you said, Joseph, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I have to recognize that there's de facto authorities, but I don't have to give them sovereign rights. If Hamas wins in a, a parliamentary election, it's one thing, but if it wins the leadership, the, the presidential election, that's another thing. The presidential election is what dictates who represents the government internationally, who represents the people and the state internationally. But the same goes for Israel. Israel is not a monolith either. You have deep, deep divides, social, economic, political, even religious, where there's more in common between the Palestinians and the Israelis who want peace, who want mutual recognition, who want mutual dignity, than there is between Israelis themselves or even Palestinians themselves. So let's not set this up as Israelis versus Palestinians but it is the right of two peoples for self-determination and the right to live in peace, security, and dignity. And that cannot happen without justice. And justice re requires recognition of past violations as well as ongoing current violations. All right, uh, let's go to Amnon and then Dan, Dan Ensla. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, first of all, two issues. One is I, uh, with respect to the veto power, I totally agree with Mona, Charles, and Len, uh, the Israeli prime minister, on the issue that, uh, first of all, we definitely have to give the uh, Palestinians in Gaza 
a, a fair representation. There's no question about it. There are people just like the Israelis. However, when it comes to a veto power, what happens here is you have three entities with veto power, Hamas, the PA, and the Israeli government. What would happen here is that no legislation that ever passed by Israelis will ever succeed if you have two vetoes against one. So as far as the veto power is concerned, give the, give the Palestinians all the representations wherever they are, Gaza or the, or the PA. But as far as veto is concerned, the Hamas and the PA must consolidate to, to voice one veto. So you have one veto for the Palestinians and one veto of the Israelis. So I agree with what Mona said and Charles and, and Len. Secondly, regarding the refugees, uh, if you look at the history and you really have to look at the re real history, in 1948, when seven Arab countries invaded the fledgling Israel, the Arab leaders told the, the uh, Arabs who lived in that territory, when we come in and occupy and destroy the Jews, we're going to kill all of you if you don't flee that area, we'll consider you as traitors. And those so-called refugees, they decided on their own volition to leave that country and they escaped. Had they stayed there, they would have been Israeli citizens as those Arabs who chose to stay and they lived there better than any Arabs in any Arab country. So, I'm no, no then let me, let me just, just say this. No Israeli government in its right mind will ever allow return of two million so-called refugees and their descendants into this country because those refugees do not fall under the international definition of refugees. They were not afraid of their lives to be killed by Israel. They were afraid that their own leaders will kill them. That's why they fled. So Len is not the enemy of peace, as you said wrongly, Joseph. He is the saver of the Jewish state because if you bring in two million refugees or more, you will destroy the nature of the Jewish state, Israel, demographically, and everything else. So uh, he is absolutely right. Len is absolutely right. I agree with you. Uh, you are not the enemy of peace. You just but, Amnon, what is your question? So my question, my question here is this. We need to find out how Arab countries... What is the how, question, Amnon? It's, oh, not, it's how, not a lecture. How, it's just, it's, we, it's uh, a simulation and we have... A, let, let me finish, Joseph. How can we persuade... Look, that, we have a simulation. And here is my question. 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 We're not here to listen to a lecture. I'm here sorry. is my question. Okay. Here is my question, please, Joseph. If you want to run it democratically, let people speak their mind. No, I'm running simulation. I'm not here to run lectures Joseph, for or against Israel. Joseph, we have a visitor, and I would like to have questions asked of so, her. So here is my question. How can we persuade the Arab countries, that there are about 28 or 56 Arab countries with vast territories, how can we persuade them to absorb the so-called refugees that they live in other Arab countries to take them in and, and absorb them and make them flourish like the Jewish refugees who came from other countries and build a country. They build a country in Israel. How come the so-called Arab refugees, which are not refugees, cannot be absorbed by Arab countries where they live now? So can you answer this question, please? So Mona, he's, he, I, I don't think he's asking to convince them to accept the so-called refugees. I think he he wants to ex Arab countries mm -hmm. to accept the Palestinian refugees. That's because the there's, there's no way that Israel will let two million people in. There's no way. There will be right, destruction of the let's, state of Israel. Let's have Mona answer your question. Yeah. I, will, I will 
referred to the fact that for 2000 years, the Jews that were forced out of the lands by the Romans in the diaspora for 2000 years held on to their right of return and lived by the motto and the slogan next year in Jerusalem. If after 2000 of years, you have the right of return, sir, then why cannot the Palestinian after merely 70 years not have the right to return to their homeland? If they recognize that the new sovereign in that homeland is Israel, and if they're willing to give up the right of citizenship in order to live in their homeland, by recognizing the new sovereign, there should be a right of return that is not a so-called right of return. It is an absolute inalienable right of return. And if nobody believes it, read the chat box. There's a reference to the Refugee Convention that lays it all out in black and white, adopted by the international community, by the overwhelming number of members of the UN making it customary international law that is binding on all states <clears throat> and that the UN has every year by overwhelming majorities recognized the Palestinian refugees as refugees, sir, whether you recognize them or not, that have rights and have a right of return. And Israel has placed the right of return as one of the five issues. So it recognizes there is a right of return. Now, how we exercise that right how we forfeit that right, how we negotiate that right, how we ultimately accept compensation for that right are to be negotiated. But it is not for you when the Israeli government itself has not negated that right for you to do so. So I suggest you read the International Convention. And if you truly adopt the legislation on mutual tolerance, then you would refrain from making such uh, negating dismissive disrespectful and inhumane comments about people who like the people in ukraine today are running for their lives from violence and war and destruction like the people who fled from many wars it's a human condition to flee violence to flee fear massacres were happening now no side has clean hands you're right about that but they were fleeing not only Israeli violence, but Ergun violence and Stern gang violence. You did not only have the Israeli defensive forces, which at, at that point had not yet been called the Israeli defense forces, but you had terrorist organizations within your ranks that your own leaders had to neutralize and disarm and bring into the ranks for those who were willing to set aside their terrorist tendencies to join the Jewish forces, to be worthy of joining the Jewish forces which for many ceased to be IDF and became IOF after 67. But at that time, they were fighting for their liberation from the British mandate, and they were fighting to defend for their independence of their state. But your right of self-determination does not replace our right to return. Your right of self-determination entitles you to a state, entitles you to self-determination, but it does not negate the historical narrative that in order to build your state, you dispossess several thousands, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who still enjoy rights and who can exercise that right in accordance with international law and subject to the negotiations. And no negotiation will be successful until both sides agree. And Israel will have a voice, obviously, by definition, by the diktat, both of power and of principle, will have a say in those negotiations. But do not negate those rights. If you truly believe in tolerance, peace and dignity and equal rights to both sides. Okay, let's go. Well, now you ask me. You ask me a question in thirty. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. Well, let's go to Dan. We're not gonna. Let's go to Dan now. That's not fair. Dan. No, thank you very much. Joseph, she's missing one. Let me just answer her. No, you, you. You're not the guest. It's Dan. We. We. You can't just be angry and say, "Well, it, it's my." Joseph. Let's go to Dan and have him answer. I'm trying to. We're not here. Okay, let's go to Dan. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I understand the, the concept of moving towards a, a secular perspective because it, um, it allows a way to transcend a very complex or seemingly impossible um, points of difference and get down to. Uh, we use the analogy of, of the dynamics of, of the way the globe works 
there's an outer hard crust, but underneath there's this powerful um, fluid magna, which deals with the, the human heart, which deals with a longing for justice and peace and prosperity and tranquility for everybody. And getting down to that level um, allows for a great deal of, of coming together in unity. But at the same time, um, there's a, a way where religion is helps people <laughs> integrate uniquely with how the creative process works. And so it, it seems like there's a place to consider the role of religion, given it's, it's so much defining um, the various relationships. You know, the, <clears throat> the definition of the Jewish people for 5,000 years to, to progress and, and do magnificent things, but also um, in the power of, of the Quran and, and in terms of offering guidance. And so I would, in, in conclusion, invite you to, to look at Haifa as having a, a, a model of, that is uniquely different in terms of the way religion is perceived and, and re religious people work together and see if that's a, something that would assist this process. Thank you very much. So do you have a question, Dan? Um, you know, the question is, is how could the, the dynamics of the Haifa area help um, create a new vision for new possibilities? Okay, Mona. You need to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. Right. Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? He's basically referring to Haifa as a model of coexistence between Jews and Muslim and Christians, and he's asking how can we replicate that model? I think that's what you're asking, correct, Dan? Yeah, basically, how, how can that assist with developing new ideas? Absolutely, yeah. No, I'm. Uh, of course, we welcome the coexistence as 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 the fundamental recognition of each other's humanity and each other's uh, equal rights to human rights. Um, but we have. I mean, I don't want to say uh, 2,000 years of a model because for 2,000 years, Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims did, I mean, maybe not 2,000 years because of the, the times when they came into existence, but there were several hundreds of years, let's say, where Palestinians of Jewish, Muslim, and Christian faith lived together. Jerusalem is a testimony both to the different conquerors of Jerusalem, but also to the, to the reverence that all three religions all three Abrahamic religions recognize and respect and, and revere about Jerusalem. So there are many models for, for this. Haifa is one, Jerusalem itself can be another, um, that our love of it should unite us instead of dividing us. And that our, our, I find that as Semitic peoples, we're extremely similar in our culture, so extremely similar in our daily practices and our religious practices, extremely similar in our experience. I mean, uh, uh, the, the Jewish members of European society and American society are amongst the most successful and have contributed to the advancements of European society and of uh, American society. Similarly, Palestinians in the Arab countries are in large part the builders of the architecture of those countries, educators and their learning systems. Um, so as, as refugees, as people who have been exiled and diaspora, we have that in common as well to build on. Um, albeit that, you know, different causes for the diaspora and for the, uh, the state of being a refugee, but we have that common experience. Now, again, I think the people of goodwill within both communities are there. The 55% you're looking for is probably much higher, but we've allowed for too long those on the extremes to hold our politics hostage, to hold our policies hostage, to hold our ability to realize what is not just common sense, but in our common uh, self-preservation. Because the longer we go without a peaceful, legally based comprehensive solution that recognizes both peoples, the more we fall to the, the fate of ha having more and more radicalization in both of our communities and more and more paralysis and hostage taking by those extremist elements against what I believe, I still believe, are the moderates in both camps. 
the peace camp in Israel has been quieted for too long. I'm happy to see that Yossi Berlin and others are, are stepping up, are, are overcoming the, the latency that has defined the recent past. Um, I, I also believe that it is time for new leadership in Palestine, um, that there should be uh, a, a new elections with respect for whatever the outcome. If we, if we say we want democracy, we have to accept the results of a democratic election um, and, and allow the new generation to define the direction that, that the, the, the next phase will take. But it all has to be based on the fundamental human rights, on the fundamental rules of international law and the Geneva Conventions and of the recognition that no side has a monopoly on rights or monopoly on wrongs. And where crimes are being investigated, it's individuals who will be held accountable. Criminal accountability is by definition individual. So I can prosecute the Israeli soldier who disproportionately kills civilians and or indiscriminately kill civilians the same way I can prosecute the Hamas leader who orders an indiscriminate attack against the civilian target. That doesn't mean I'm prosecuting Israel itself or Palestine itself. The same way I can criticize US foreign policy, I have the right to criticize Israeli policy and Palestinian policy. That is an imperative. And those who really want the best interest of both peoples need to be critical of their own side and open to the other. And that includes both sides. Dan is asking, how do you make that happen? Not, we all agree that that needs to be happened, but how do you make it happen? Because we've seen it. I mean, in the aftermath of the Oslo peace accords, which were very much held hostage by the assassination by a extremist Jewish settler of the assassination of Rabin, was based on that fundamental premise that the Israeli peace seeker and the Palestinian peace seeker, the same way there are peace seekers here today, have more in common with each other than those on the far extremes of both peoples that want to deny the overwhelming majority that vision of a, of a future where their children live in peace and dignity and mutual respect. Are you? Are you, are you very easy. We need, to, we need to let that majority take over. We need to let that majority define our policies, define our politics, define our election of our leaders on both sides. Are you, do you have a stand regarding one state, two state uh, confederation that is proposed or confederation as Yossi mm. Bailing proposed, which is really two state? I, I believe in the two states because I believe we need to recognize the two peoples as two distinct peoples who need, who need to manifest their right of self-determination. I do believe there is merit in having a confederation uh, that feeds uh, into the higher calling and the commonality of the economic reality and the territorial reality. But I do not believe that this veto, and if I may enter into some of my comments, should be given across all all issues. And I see that in your constitution, you do differentiate between issues that belong with the two states, probably security, borders, such things, but that not all issues belong to the two states. They can be dealt with by the confederation, issues of human rights, which are universal, issues of mutual respect and tolerance, which should be universal. Uh, so that distinction should be maintained. And the veto should only be available. You're fading. You're what, what's happening? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes, hear me? Can hear you. Okay. And the veto should only be available as, as, as yeah, indicated we can hear in the you. Constitution for those issues that are linked to the, the national security or to the borders or so on and so forth. Uh, the veto shouldn't be on all of your proposals and all of your draft legislation even for the Israeli government and the Palestinian government. And to those who think that it's going to be two votes against one where Hamas and Palestine okay, have to um, vote. Yeah. Joseph, I, I, I'm not having a problem hearing her. Are you? I am, yeah. But, yeah, no, she's doing well. And, and I think it's on your end, Joseph. She's oh, okay. finishing. Sorry, Mona. No, not at all. No, no, no. This has been an amazing experience for me as well. I mean, it really has uh, 
it gives me great hope that we have so many people who are interested and who are willing to 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 imagine this world where we're all you know able to have this conversation and i and i applaud all of you and joseph in particular for 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 uh conceiving of this and and pursuing it in order to make it uh, a reality where where israelis and palestinians can be equal seekers of justice and peace and, and security for, for both of their peoples. Mana, let me, let me take this a step further because uh, when people say they support the two state, my question to you, is there a priority? Should there be two state first and then a confederation? Or it doesn't really matter whether the confederation is first and the two state is second? Well, I mean, the reality is that the two states do exist. So, I mean, by definition, that is the reality. So, if you're going to introduce something new, it has to be over and above the two states. We, we're not, as you said, you're not undoing the two states. You're not denying their existence. You're not denying their sovereignty. So, by definition, they're first. And the Confederation can assist them, can shepherd them to a better tomorrow by showing them what is possible recapturing the majority of Israelis and Palestinians who today, because of internal politics, are not the majority voice, even though they're the majority in numbers. The fact that Israel's election is based on coalition building, extremists tend to have an overdue influence um, on the ultimate outcome of Israeli politics, when in fact the majority, uh, in terms of the, the fundamentals of what a peace, peace would look like, if you were to take a poll, I think you would find a groundswell in favor of these land swaps that, that both sides are talking about. You would find in favor of mutual recognition and mutual respect and mutual uh, living and coexistence with peace and security. I, I do believe that. Maybe I'm naive, but I do believe we still have that opportunity. And the Confederation, the way you've set it up, can help shepherd what is possible. Where are the points of mutual agreement, 55% of each population? where necessary 65% of each population that can shine a light and a, and a sign like a big green look here sign to each of those governments that you're not actually acting in the best interest of your peoples when you pursue policies that make it harder to reach a peace agreement and mutual existence and mutual respect. Okay, let's go uh, to Abraham. Did you raise your hand? To Abraham and Len, did you raise your hand? Yes. Okay, so those Abraham and then Len. Yeah. It's over. It's past eight o'clock. So can we make those the last two? Okay. So Abraham and then Len and then. Oh, uh, Sean. Sean, I see Sean. Okay. We'll close the door on Sean after Sean. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Just, uh, just to a note on the technicality of the vetoes. Uh, because there are two Palestinian vetoes does not mean that there is a majority of Palestinians against Israel, of course. It's not a voting mechanism. <clears throat> Israel's veto uh, is uh, as strong as uh, the two vetoes from the Palestinian parties. Of course, the, the Palestinian uh, <clears throat> party should be unified, but that is not the case at this time, but is expected to be a, a unified government at some future point. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, again, there should be um, respect for the elected sovereign. Part of the problem in Palestine is we haven't had elections in, in I don't know, 20 years, 15 years. I, I don't know the exact number, but there needs to be elections. And part of the uh, impediments is the situation on the ground. But it's also obviously the shameful lack of unity between the legislatively elected uh, Hamas and the presidentially elected Palestinian Authority. Nonetheless, it should be one sovereign. The agreements say West Bank and Gaza are one territorial unit legally, internationally recognized as such, and therefore should, there should be one representative. In my view, you'll probably have Israel and Hamas voting on the side more <coughs> often than, than you will have Hamas and the Palestinian Authority voting on the same side. Because Israel won't want partial and Hamas will insist on everything or nothing in many cases. But for those who have pointed out that Hamas is willing to engage in negotiations, has recognized Israel and its pre-67 borders, and has, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, recognized the need for a settlement, and a peaceful settlement, they're correct. Hamas's position is very different than what is being described here today. However, in order to remain relevant, 
at the international level because it lacks international legal personality, it will exercise the veto that you're giving it just to remain relevant. So you're actually defeating the peace uh, intentions of your confederation by, by holding yourself hostage. In that dream scenario where you have the Israeli government and the Palestinian government saying yes to your legislation, why would you even risk that? You can give them a voice. You can give them even a platform, but there's no need to give them a veto. All right, let's go to Lane. Okay, uh, I have a question for you, Mona. First, I want to say that what uh, what ruined the Oslo Accords was uh, not the murder, but what ruined it was the uh, Second Intifada, which uh, was generated by Abbas and uh, murdered a thousand Israelis and wounded two other two other thousand Israelis. That's what ruined uh, what ruined uh, the Oslo Accord, and that's what created the walls and the security barriers. Um, and also the 1949, and you call them 67, armistice line was never recognized by anybody in the whole world as a border. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Transjordan occupation was considered illegal by everybody except I think Britain was the only country that accepted it. However, in spite of that, Israel offered the Palestinians to have everything you say you want now, except of course for flooding Israel with refugees, all of Gaza, all of the West Bank. And then what is the question? The question is, why did the PA keep refusing to take exactly what you say you would like? Why did they refuse it in, in, in 48, 49? And why did they refuse it in 67 after the 67 war? Israel was prepared to make peace right then and there give them the whole thing, walk out of area that was illegal, including areas like Sheikh Sharah, which were Jewish and uh, ethnically cleansed by the Jordanians and their British allies. The question is, why has, have the Palestinians and the Arab League continuously refused to accept? Uh, I, I don't, I mean, there, there are elements of truth in what you're saying, but it is not entirely true because in fact, the picture from 47 till present has metamorphosized multiple times. First of all, in 1947, when you're saying uh, the Arab, uh, and you refer to it as a monolith, which it was not, rejected the, the, uh, the, the partition of Palestine. Be part of that was because at the time, the, uh, the Jewish control of the land was approximately anywhere from five to 15%. And the Israeli partition resolution gave them 55% of the land. I think if you were in those, in those shoes, you would similarly have a problem with that proposal. Then in 67, so that was the rejection in 47. In 67, there was a war that may have been triggered by a preemptive strike against uh, uh, Egyptian activity. By the same token, what ended up happening is occupation, and this is written by your own legal advisors, Israeli legal advisors of land in Sinai, Gaza, West Bank, and Syria. And by your own legal advisor's advice, this land had to be returned. It could be occupied for military advantage until the, the state of hostilities is over, but it could not be retained legally beyond that. Here we are nearly, I, I can't do the math instantaneously, but more than 50 years later, where that occupation still exists. So that's why they say no, sir. Number three, I think everybody, let me, let me just end on a happy note. I hope you'll welcome that. Since I would say the 80s and certainly by the 90s, there has been a recognition of the need under certain circumstances for mutual recognition of Israel by all Arabs. And in fact, by the entire organization of the League of Arab States and the organization of the Islamic Conference that in return, for a, a, a recognition of an actual border. Israel itself has never said where it wants its border to be, first of all, but in return for the occupy, uh, end of the occupation with certain land swaps that the Palestinians are willing to accept, that there will be full recognition of Israel as a state, that there will be diplomatic relations with Israel, not from just one or two neighboring countries as you have with Egypt and Jordan, and now you have with Bahrain and UAE, but with the entire League of Arab States, 
The Arab peace plan has been on the table for more than 20 years, offering you all of that. So they are, it's, it's a fact, sir. And it's recognized by the Security Council, including by the United States. And the second thing is that that plan is also endorsed by the entire Muslim world. So this should be assurance of a possibility of not only mutual respect and mutual recognition, but also mutual relations. There is a better day if we accept certain fundamental facts. All right, Bring let's it go, the occupation let's that go, well. we, we are way over our time. Let's go to Sean and then we'll do the closing remarks. Okay, okay. Um, my concern is uh, right now, uh, the, um, Okay, yeah. My concern is that uh, right now, Israel and Palestine, you know, are currently not finding common grounds with each other. They are in some way, but uh, they're not fully finding common grounds. And my concern is that uh, if, with the history, I don't think they're finding common grounds in the history of, uh, you know, the land of Palestine, the land of Israel. They are just believing that the, the, this is their land in Palestine, is, like Israel is believing that this is their land in uh, Palestine is believing that it's their land and they're not finding common ground. So I'm currently, uh, my question is, how can they currently find common grounds right now if they can't find common ground in history of the land? That's my question. I mean, the Israeli and Palestinian people will not be the first or the last people to have aspirations that go beyond their their current realities. I mean, they're the, uh, compromise is by definition what peace agreements are about and it's essential to ensure that any two peoples can uh, recognize each other's narratives to the degree that is needed not necessarily in their entirety to uh, to be able to prevent further suffering to prevent further violations to prevent further uh, uh, atrocities in some cases and to ensure that there is, an end to violations, an end to suffering, and an end to those uh, to those hostilities. So, by definition, you don't make peace with your friends; you make peace with your enemies. Um, and therefore, the the fundamental recognition that it is in the best interest of each side, until each side recognizes that there's more to be accomplished, to put the value of each civilian, whether it's an Israeli civilian or a Palestinian civilian, above the uh, the uh, the other political interests of this party or that party or this group versus that group, even within our own constituencies, has to prevail. Right now, we've let the extremists and we've let the the, the political apparatchiks uh, of old, frankly, the, the both neither side. You know, we've had Netanyahu for a hundred years. We've had Abbas for a hundred years. We, they don't really represent today's Israeli or today's Palestinian. We've let the extremists on both sides hold us hostage. So it's easier to find common ground if we let the true voices through democratic processes that allow the majority to prevail in both sides and neither political system is certainly currently allowing for that. Even if there are democratic elections in Israel, it's not the majority that prevails, it's the coalition building that prevails which oftentimes involves bringing in voices from the far, far extremes of, of, of the Israeli political spectrum. So as we build on those majorities, as we give voice to the true voice of the people and come back to the individual human rights and to the individual rights of the peoples, I think there is not just possibility, but opportunity and actual potential for that groundswell on both sides to overcome the, the, the paralysis of today. Okay, so I wanna uh, give some comment, uh, closing remarks. I have a, a slide for that, but I would like to, I think Sean's question was very, very powerful. And I think that, um, Really, it demonstrates why the IPC is such a powerful force, could be. And it's because we are not about land. We are about people. Sean asked why, how come the Israelis and the Palestinians did not agree uh, about people and why would they agree in the future? And I, I agree with him. They're not gonna agree about land 
they are only going to agree about people. And that's what we are all about, is agreeing about uh, people. People need are more important than, uh, than land. And people can make peace uh, with, them, with each other much more than they can agree about land. So I'm looking for my slide, oh, here. So let's make it happen. The Israeli and the Palestinian governments are unable to make peace, just like Sean said, and I agree, because they focus on land. The solution is democracy, which brings equality, which brings peace. The country of Estonia with nine and a half million people, 40% of their voting is online. So the assumptions that we showed at the beginning are realistic. Common election is possible. A war between Israel and Gaza is $100 million a day. $100 million could create the election and could change everything. So we need grassroots support. And I'm asking you to share and to uh, tell the media about what we're doing. So thank you so much, Mona. And thank you all for joining. And um, um, uh, if you want to send me an email, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much.